Hello students, I hope you are all doing well. Now, with respect to our lectures on environmental law, in today's lecture, I wish to discuss something which is very crucial from environmental legal point. In my previous lectures, I came across this particular legislation that I'm going to discuss. I've been referring to this legislation as the umbrella legislation with respect to environmental protection. And at the same point of time, when we discussed about several pollution related legal regimes or be it with respect to other avenues, say coastal area zones, which we discussed in uh, the previous lecture. In fact, I referred there was a passing reference of Environment Protection Act and particularly particularly a section, section three, to be very precise, of the State Act. Now, in this today's lecture, I'm going to take you to those crucial uh, avenues of Environment Protection Act. Now, this is very small legislation, but very powerful. And if you remember, Bhopal case tragedy was a learning no lesson it was a lesson for everyone it was a lesson for industrialists it was a lesson for civil society organizations it was lessons for individuals society at large and of course of all the government and because of that which happened you know which year uh, and this unfortunate accident industrial incident kind of changed the legal shape of our country even with respect to liability even with respect to enhanced protection well Bhopal gas tragedy was I, I, I believe it is one of the reasons because of which we have this Environment Protection Act of 1986 in addition to all the international obligations that India had from Stockholm now, when it comes to environmental law of our country, this particular legislation is very crucial. And why is it so? Let's see. Now, when we discuss about Environment Protection Act, the first thing, in fact, when we discuss about environmental law per se, the first thing that, of course, I hope it comes to your mind that what exactly is my environment. And I remember in one of those lectures that we had initially, offline lectures, I asked this question to all of you and I remember you all have a very broad perspectives and idea about environment and you came up with your respective definitions. Some of them appear a bit scientific, some of them appear a bit sociological, but in a way, all of them were right. And when it comes to environment in the literal connotation, I'm pretty sure there are several such references, be it the dictionary, be it the judgments, you will come across this. In addition to that, you must have also heard about this term ecology. And many a times environment and ecology, they are used very much interchangeably. But you need to make a distinction also between the same. When it comes to this term ecology, it basically derived from the Greek word oikos. This oikos means to place a place to live. So oikos, from there, that's the etymology of this term ecology from ecos to ecos it became ecology so it's a greek word so most of the you know ecologists they define ecology as a study of relationships of an organism or a group of organisms with their environment so you will come across several such definitions given by scientists thinkers from time to time like for example ernst haeckel is one of them who in fact is also known for Coining this term, he developed it as a terminological form and defined it as ecology, as a study of reciprocal relations between organisms and their surroundings. Now, when we talk about ecology, when we talk about human ecology, in fact, we take a very broader perspective. We talk about integrating the movement founded on the proposition of the interdependence that is there with respect to several competing groups between the humans itself or between humans and several other forms of life. It can also be certain physical and mental activities, the relationship what I'm referring. So it is true to say that this term itself is pretty much broad. While on the other hand, when you talk about 
environment the term environment it is quite related to this particular term despite the fact that they are used interchangeably we'll come to that definition of environment now even before we get into that definition of environment we should also keep in mind that when well, we are staying the place itself the ecosystem itself it is it comprises of several biotic and abiotic substances right even the virus that is kind of brought a wrath uh, over the entire mankind at this point of time it is also part of the ecosystem may be created by us discovered and thereafter propagated but it is part of this ecosystem so biotic abiotic all these are in a way part and parcel and here we have the producer we have the consumers and we also have the decomposers so basically these are the three biotic substances the producers the consumers and the decomposers and when it comes to ecosystem at large it has several functions also they are also regarded as the autotrophs because you know that they are self you know in a way they are responsible for fixing so many things and there are also something called heterotrophs where you know you will find this ecosystem where you know the organisms they cannot make their own food and they are very much dependent on producers for their food and when it comes to this entire thing we have producers we have consumers we have decomposers even in the consumers you will come across several levels of consumers you will find primary secondary tertiary like this now ecology ecosystem entire thing is all there and when we talk about from the perspective of you know uh, types of ecosystem you will come across basically two types right terrestrial ecosystem and aquatic ecosystem and why i'm referring to all these things i'm pretty much sure that you are all well aware of the science behind it you are all aware of these basic science basic knowledge about ecosystem but why i'm referring this i'm setting the stage now what i'm sitting why i'm saying this stage because it is very difficult at the same point of time to encompass everything under one roof but an endeavor has been made with respect to this and environment when you talk about the term environment in fact when you talk about the literal uh, etymology or in fact several other definitions that you will come across the environment there is something which you will find they have a very broader broader perspectives now why is it so when it comes to environment in fact if you refer to the texts which is available you will you can come across this encyclopedia for example encyclopedia of environmental science it endeavors to define environment as a you know sum of all some total of all the conditions and influences that affect the development and life of organisms so in a way it takes a very comprehensive approach because it uses the term the sum total of all conditions and influences so it's it's in a way stressing upon totality of everything there are several such instances where scholars have also defined like for example according to gilpin environment is something which has a very scientific point of view and it is taken to mean everything that is physically external to the organism or organisms of course which also include human beings in it even the judges they were also kind of they were not lagging behind they also came forward and defined environment the green judges were there in fact there was very famous judge besides kuldeep singh if you have heard about this p n bhagwati the honorable justice p n bhagwati in fact he made the term environment more clear when he opined this as if you refer to this uh, you know there was long time back in 1991 there was an article in the hindu the title of that article was the crucial conditions it was basically in survey of the environment where honorable justice p n bhagwati he opined environment as something as the conditions within and around an organism which affect the behavior growth development of life processes directly or indirectly and it includes the conditions with which the organisms interact the same thing was also done in a way forward when you know you remember i have referred to this godavarman case repeatedly even in godavarman case t and godavarman tirumal par versus union of india the 2002 case where it was in fact about the honorable apex court endeavor to define environment in fact it kind of acknowledged the fact that environment is very difficult word to define in a normal meaning it relates to surroundings right but obviously that is a concept which is quite relatable to whatever object it is which is surrounded and in fact 
Albert Einstein was also referred in the judgment of Kota Varman. Yes. In fact, the Honorable Apex Court referred to Einstein when he said once that the environment is everything that is not me. So these are the literal connotations of the term environment. Now, when you try to define something, you have so many uh, stakeholders here. You know, you have uh, environmentalists here, you have government entities here. So it is very difficult at the same point of time. But going by the genesis of this particular term, you will come across from the term which derives its origin from a French word environner. Now, environner, even in Latin word, there was a term called environ, which means to surround. So etymologically, this term means surrounding conditions, circumstances which affects people's life. So in several occasions, be it the judiciary, be it the thinkers, jurists, legislators, commentators, so on and so forth, they have all endeavored, uh, you know, they have taken so many, they have taken so many attempts to define what exactly is environment. But finally, so this is very difficult in a way. So in order to define something which has a very broader perspective, it's a big challenge. So from Indian perspective, the legal connotation that we have with respect to this term environment will take you to section 2 clause a of environment protection act 1986 now this is the first statute in the history of environmental law which defined the term environment and as per this eight legislation as per this eight clause environment includes water air land and the interrelationship which exists among and between water, air and land and human beings and other living creatures, plants, microorganisms and property. So in a way, this definition includes water, air, land for sure. It talks about the second element, which is the interrelationship that exists between and amongst water, air, land and human beings, living creatures, plants, microorganisms and property. So th this is what it includes and it includes not just the inanimate objects but also animate objects and their relationships. So in a way this definition is of course uh, is quite unitary in nature but the wider definition will definitely you know in a way if you interpret it it embraces within itself it encompasses within itself all the biotic and abiotic components of the environment. In fact, there was this case, if I am not wrong, uh, I've referred it, the Virender Gaur versus State of Haryana. The Virender Gaur versus State of Haryana case, which is from 1995, the Honorable Apex Court, in fact, defined it, declared that the word environment is of broad spectrum. So, which means, which brings within its ambit, hygienic atmosphere and ecological balance. So, from time to time, even the courts have defined environment. Another crucial definition is there with respect to environment is, of course, the reason because of which we have this law, that is pollutants. Now, environmental pollution, pollutants are something which becomes a menace, of course, in this particular century. Even in couple of last couple of decades, we have seen the drastic rise in global temperature. It's all because thanks to these pollutants, but no thanks. Now, with respect to this environmental pollutant, if you refer to this clause 2B, of Environment Protection Act 1986, you will find that it has been defined as any solid, liquid or gaseous substances which is present in such concentration as may be or tend to be injurious to environment. Although it doesn't talk about exclusively on human health, but let me be very clear with you, the term environment itself covers human beings. And when you talk about interrelationship of human beings, of course, the human health factor is also taken into consideration along with the ecosystem vitality. So pollutants, basically here, they have referred as solid, liquid or gaseous substances, as we all know. And that's why we studied Air Act, we studied Water Act, we also refer to noise and vehicle pollution. So in a way, all these pollutants are you know, the great menace and the law, in fact, aims to address the issues relating to the same. If you remember in one of the cases, which I have already referred, the Taj trapezium case, where the emission of the, you know, the issue of uh, acid rain, where the emission of sulfur dioxide was kind of uh, affecting the Taj Mahal. And that was because of the coal and the diesel industries, which were being 
totally functional nearby Taj Mahal. So in several such instances where this term environment pollutant has been emphasized and re-emphasized by the Honorable Apex Court and it has taken the amplitude to a very next level. The same thing also happened in Velour Citizens Forum, Welfare Forum versus Union of India, where all these types of chemicals like sodium chloride, lime, so, so basically the thing is that these are all having certain physical chemical properties and they also can cause pollutant uh, pollutions be it for soil or for water or even for groundwater so they are all in a way you know up lately i've been writing a lot about uh, uh, you know covid 19 and legal angle and i was also referring to certain videos and lectures which were available which kind of opened my eye about several facts uh, so you cannot expect you know a scholar to go everywhere and these days the information is all with you so with respect to groundwater also i was writing a paper and there i came across that in the state of assam you know we have major uh, water contamination problem in fact in guwahati itself we have the problem of fluoride we have the problem of uh, iron we have the problem of arsenic in jorhat and some of those other districts and it's not just that let me be very clear with you there are several other sulfate uh, you know contents which are also again a major problem and you know what these are all outcome of these electronic goods which are not properly disposed of so environmental pollutant has a very wide ambit because there are new new kinds and forms of pollutants which are emerging because of the technology that we are using these days right so this is the way that they have defined air so you know solid liquid and gaseous but you know it's when it comes to interpretation when it comes to its amplitude and its ambit it's get pretty much wider in fact noise is also a pollutant which you cannot uh, of course you can perceive it with certain senses but you cannot see it but you can perceive it with, by hearing right so but it is a pollutant so in a way this all these things have been kind of described from time to time and that's the reason because of which we have studied air act water act to emphasize more on air pollutants than on land pollutants water pollutants so on and so forth now in addition to this uh, environment protection act which we are discussing there are several other legislations which were on outcome of this environment protection act which we will discuss like we have already discussed once a coastal regulation zone it was an outcome of environment protection act only i've mentioned it is the central government which enacted this coastal zone regulations and that power was given to central government by this particular legislation eba 1986 now when it comes to handling of these so-called pollutants it is very difficult to understand if you don't have have a very cl clear clarity legal clarity also at the same point of time and you know what this environment protection act of 1986 it defines it it defines handling it defines handling as uh, you know with respect to the substances that we am referring it means manufacturing processing the treatment package storage transportation use collection destruction conversion even offering for sale transfer or like of any such substances so this is like a wider you know, the list of activities which has been kind of considered to define the term handling. And this is with respect to this is vis-a-vis -vis environment pollutant, be it air, be it, you know, other forms of solid pollutants, uh, water pollutants. So this is what it is. And this is very much relevant with respect to waste management, because if you refer to the waste management rules that we have in our country, be it with respect to biomedical, be it with respect to municipal solid, hazardous, then plastic, so on and so forth, electronic waste, uh, all of them have used the term handling, management and handling. So handling is a very different term, difficult term because it has a very wide meaning. It is inclusive. It includes all these activities, say manufacturing, processing, treatment, uh, you know, then package, storage, transportation, use, collection, destruction, conversion, transfer, etc., etc. And when it comes to, uh, you know, addressing certain pollutants, the hazardousness of those pollutants is very significant. They can be hazardous to environment, of course, but they can also be hazardous to human health. And when it comes to hazardous substances, you should refer to section 2E, 2 clause E of Environment Protection Act, which defined hazardous substance as any substance or preparation which by reason of its chemical or physical chemical properties or handling is liable to cause harm to human beings, other living creatures, plants, microorganisms, property, or the environment itself at large, right? So methyl isocyanide was hazardous in nature, right? So all these are the things which which is very much significant at the same point of time. Now, I'll ask you one question. What do you think, whether electricity is a hazardous substance? 
Many of you will wonder, no, of course not. Why would electricity be as other substances? Now, I beg to differ because there was a judgment by Mad Madhya Pradesh High Court, not the Apex Court though. It was Madhya Pradesh SEB, State Electricity Board, Madhya Pradesh State Electricity Board versus Collector. Now, this particular case was from the year 2003 when the Honorable Madhya Pradesh High Court has declared that electricity is a hazardous substances in any quantity as its physical chemical properties are liable to cause harm to human beings and other living creatures even plants microorganisms so hazardous substances the definition of hazardous substances has been implemented and have a, sorry interpreted from the perspective of how far damage it can cause to humans or any other living creatures or environment at large right so these are some of the crucial definitions which you should refer to uh, when you read environment protection act of 1986 now Another significant part or cardinal feature of this particular legislation is with respect to uh, the power of the central government because it is because of this section 3 of Environment Protection Act, all these other rules, be it hazardous waste management and handling rules, hazardous chemicals uh, law of 1989, hazardous microorganisms law of 1989, biomedical waste management rules of 2016, then plastic waste management rules of 2016, electronic waste management handling of 2016, coastal regulation zones, uh, notifications, then you have the environment impact as assessment notification. All these are outcome of this particular section three because it empowers the central government to take measure to protect and improve the environment. And in order to do so, there are a list of activities which has been envisaged in the given legislation, which includes coordination of actions by state government the central government will take all the measures to ensure that be it with respect to state governments be it with respect to officers appointed by them or even other authorities under the state act be it with respect to any other actions which of course is relatable to this particular object of this act when it comes to planning and execution the central government can also organize nationwide programs from time to time to prevent control and abatement of environment pollution and here we have seen Central government is on the helms of the affairs. When we studied Water Act, when we studied Air Act, you remember I referred to central government, central pollution control board, state government, state pollution control board, and the hierarchy of the power. In fact, when there was any dispute, any contradiction with respect to any order given by the state government and central pollution control board, it is the central government, state government and central, uh, st st sorry, state government and central pollution control board, it is the central government which will chip in. We have studied that, right? So with respect to generation of awareness, with respect to taking such measures to abate pollution or prevention or even control of the same planning and execution of the nationwide program is under the realm of central government it can also lay down standards from time to time in fact after it subsequently this particular environment protection act of 1986 there was a rule there was a rule which was adopted in the same year 1986 environment protection rules of 1986 you should also refer to that it is very significant in a way and it is the central government which has a rule making power also under this particular section it can also lay down standards for ensuring, you know, quality of the environment in various various aspects. It lays down standards, ambient qualities, etc., etc. It in fact directs, right, uh, with respect to discharge, with respect to emissions of environmental pollutions, provided that different standards for emissions and discharge may be laid down under this clause for different sources, right? It cannot just put a straight jacket over everything because the nature of industry is also quite, you know, relation, the relative in a way, and it is also quite subjective. So that's the reason that all the industries might not have the same kind of standards, right? Heavy industries, medium industries, small scale industries, they will have different sources uh, of, uh, you know, they will lead to different sources of a discharge and emission. So that will be another significant factor which the central government will take into consideration while determining the same. In addition, it can also, you know, uh, impose certain restriction of areas where industries, operation processes, or even class of industries, operations or processes shall not be carried out. Uh, it will also lay down procedures, safeguards for prevention of accidents which may cause environmental pollution. And this was, of course, an outcome of the Bhopal gas tragedy and remedial measures of the accident because there has to be certain liability. We know absolute liability concept was implemented, but with respect to certain legislative measure, it's the central government which is empowered to do so.
Now, at the same point of time, you will also come across several other powers, which includes examination of manufacturing processes, material substances that are likely to cause environmental pollution, sponsoring investigations, implementing on research and development. Well, you know, many a times the central government appoints certain authorities like NIRI, for example, to conduct certain research and give up certain reports because scientific inputs is very much required to take environmental decisions. Similarly, inspection of premises, plants, equipment, machinery, acting as a watchdog is very much relevant to ensure the compliance of these norms and standards that they're adopting. So simply just laying down standards and procedures, guidelines is not sufficient until and unless you ensure, of course, with the sponsorships and all, of course, you also ensure that they are properly implemented in the very grassroots level where it's required to be. And of course, uh, you have these uh, national laboratories. If you remember in the Water Act, even in the Air Act, we have seen there were national laboratories. So the central government can also establish several environmental laboratories and institutes to carry out functions from time to time with respect to environment protection. It also publishes several reports and at the same point of time prepares manuals, codes and guides. These are basically used for all those who are supposed to execute the norms and standards adopted by the same central government. So for their guidance, they do also adopt. And in several occasions we have seen, in fact, in the previous classes, we have discussed about this Lafarge Umia mining case, be it with respect to, uh, you know, the MC Mehta's case, with with respect to NCR Delhi and, um, and and the problems relating to the pollution, be it the Godavarman Tirumulpar's case, we have seen how central government have taken all such, you know, or the Honorable Court has also recognized the power of the central government with respect to this. And when it comes to you know, planning execution of nationwide programs of on prevention, uh, you know, well, there is this case of MC Mehta versus Union of India. Also, this is from the year 1992, where the Honorable Apex Court directed that the central government should take adequate measures to make people aware about the protection of environment environment and for that you need to keep the citizens informed it is an obligation of the central government and that's the reason the honorable epics court issued several directions to the central government to fulfill this objective this obligation sorry and here the central government was uh, asked by the honorable epics court to issue directions to the state governments or even the union territories to enforce the condition to license all cinema halls tourism touring uh, cinemas video labors uh, video parlors the ministry of environment and broadcasting and, and at the same point of time making the environment a very compulsory subject in schools and colleges and everything is part of environment just the way the dog which is barking outside in this during this online lecture they're also part of environment well they cannot be guided by the central government or even the laws because they are not aware of it it's the obligation of us also as an individual as a state entity to ensure implement all these things so uh, as of now i'll just uh, keep it here only and in the subsequent lectures i'll refer to some of these outcomes which emerged out of this particular section three of environment protection act and i believe it will be relevant like environment impact assessment notification for example so until then uh, stay safe stay home and take care of yourself and your family thank you very much